So today we're going to be looking at why business is killing our fruitfulness. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at um, relationships, how, how business is affecting our relationships. <coughs> we're going to be looking at how business is affecting our work, how rest, how we don't do rest well, or, uh, and by that I mean we either, we do rest a lot, but we do it poorly, or we don't rest enough and uh, we have a, you know, a bad relationship with work. We're going to look, looking at uh, capacity, how we do church together, uh, a bunch of things, hopefully, that look, look deep into our kind of lives and hopefully in our discipleship groups over the next month as well, uh, there's been really helpful opportunities for us to examine our lives because <coughs> most of the people that I spoke with, again, just anecdotally, just conversationally over the last month or so about business, feel not just that their lives are too busy, not just that their lives are busy and they feel guilty about it, but they feel trapped in busyness. So, <coughs> yes, I'm busy. I don't feel great about being busy. There's things that I would love to do. It, not just spiritual disciplines, but, but lots of things in life. Relationships I'd love to pursue or do better in. Um, in. In my house, in my job, in my... Just, I'd love a day of not having a, a thousand plates to spin. So feeling bad or guilty about being busy but then also feeling trapped and unable to do anything about their busyness. This is a recipe for disaster, actually, for burnout, for uh, mental health problems. And so what I'm hoping is for the next month, we're going to be looking at our lives, examining our lives <coughs> through the lens of Scripture in the context of busyness, to see how God might be calling us into something much better, like a much better way of life. There may be some things, like there may be just small tweaks. There may be pa- like whole paradigm shifts that need to be made. may need to be some significant changes to how you spend your time and attention. Um, we're going to be looking at what does that life look like that God is calling you and I to, and us as a community into, uh, how in our current way of life, and especially with regard to our business, are we preventing ourselves from stepping into that? And how might we go from here to there? How does that sound? Just, you don't have to put your hand up, but just like blink real, like a lot or whatever. If if you are not feeling busy or stretched at all, just so that like, you you don't have to like put your hand up because that might make other people feel bad. Uh, But at least I'll feel really great for you. Anyone blinking? And it'll be a couple of nods, yeah. So you can just disregard the next five weeks. No, no, hopefully, hopefully there'll still be some really helpful things in here uh, because <coughs> it's possible that you are not busy by accident. It's possible um, that you're not busy because it's not busyness preventing you from fruitfulness. Uh, might be still lack of fruit, and we'll look at some of those things as well. It'll be fixed when you get to your 80s. Problem is, many people aren't getting to their 80s before they solve the problem. And so we want to we have a very fruitful life. Uh, so let, let me pray for all of us. Uh, I am not speaking as an expert in uh, life, rest, and awesomeness. Uh, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I was speaking to a pastor, a friend of mine, who's on long service leave right now. Uh, and I spoke to him the Friday before his long service died, and he said, oh, it's it's terrible <coughs> that, you know, pre- I'll preach on rest and good rhythms of life. And he goes, and I just realized I've got 12 weeks of annual leave stored up plus uh, long service leave that I haven't taken. And I was like, I was a bit shocked. I was like, whoa, that's, that's a shocker, mate. And I'm like, hang on a second. I should probably check out how much I have before I kind of throw stones. And uh, al- yeah, almost in the double digits as well. So I'm not, I'm not uh, kind of, there are, no, there are no stones being cast today. We are fellow travelers Like I do every week from scriptures, my training is in uh, theology and in journalism, and so I'm just consistently a reporter proclaiming the news. That's that's all I do Uh, every week, every day. Uh, Not the expert, but again, the fellow traveler, um, but through conversation and just through the statistics, uh, we are busy. And it's not just killing our fruitfulness, it is killing us. So we need to do something different. 
let's start with prayer and then we'll back that up with scripture. Let's do it. Father, I want to thank you for your loving attentiveness to us. Thank you for calling us into your family, into your purposes for the world, into your work in the world. Uh, as we're thinking about business now, my hope is my, my hope is, and my request from you, Lord, is that uh, we would have open hearts and minds to your spirit, to your scriptures as well, um, that this would be foundational and formative for us, not just today, but every day, um, that we wouldn't be a busy people, but we would be a people about your business in the world. And so help us, Father, to have um, those open eyes to see with clarity, to examine our lives, our attention, our loves, and to conform them to the likeness of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So um, <clears throat> not everyone is busy, that's a generalisation, but almost everyone is busy. Almost everybody is tired. Uh, especially in the last six months, the previous two years of pandemic life um, for people around the world, especially in the Western world, including Australia, uh, it seems to have really caught up with people. Some people really struggled through the pandemic, like the, the, the part of the pandemic itself. I'm not suggesting we're over it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as we started to gain some semblance of the normalcy of life pre-pandemic, uh, the weight of those two years has kind of started crashing in on people and the capacity is at an all-time low. Um, workplace engagement is at an all-time low uh, and you might be thinking, man, even before the pandemic, I was already busy. I was already flat out. I was already stretched. I was already kind of at my limit, maxed out. And yet, how come it is when I look at my life, I see so little fruit, even though I'm so busy, how am I supposed to do everything that I'm supposed to do in life and then also do these spiritual disciplines or be a good wife, husband, father, neighbor? How am I supposed to be in people's lives and invite them into mine when my life is absolutely not just full, but my plate is overflowing? How, how, how are we supposed to do that? I might think, man, I thought I'd be further along in life by now. And if, if, however old you are to this day, if we haven't kind of reached it by now, how, how am I going to get there at some stage in the future? What is it going to look like? Here's my main contention for today. <clears throat> there is currently, and always has been, a battle for your time and for your attention. There's always been a battle for your time. There's so much in the world vying, calling, advertising, and battling for your attention, but most of us have not joined the battle. So we have trillion dollar companies that spend billions of dollars working out exactly how you and I think, how best to help us without even thinking about it, uh, think a certain way, buy what they're selling, um, take up all of our time, and if not our time, at least our attention. And we have not met these forces in battle. Instead, uh, our priorities are set by our conquerors. We haven't met them in battle, and so we've been conquered by the things vying for and battling for our attention, and we voluntarily submit to our new rulers with our time, with our attention, we don't think of them as our rulers. We don't think of TV or Netflix, or I see Disney just overtook Netflix uh, for subscriptions. I'm calling it that it was Bluey that tipped them over the line internationally. Um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Snapchat. Um, so many things vying for your time. We don't think about them as our rulers, but they determine how we spend our time. And we think of it as our free time, like we have work time, that's, that's my committed time, but then I have free time, and I'm going I'm to use my free time for my free time stuff. But actually, what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping to show you from Scripture and just in general for us today is that actually all of our time uh, will show what we worship and who is our Lord. 
all of our time. We think about ourselves as victims of our busyness. So we think, oh man, I'm just so busy. Um, I wish I could, but I'm busy. I'd like to be a better husband, but I'm so busy. Wish I could be a better mother, but I'm too busy. Wish I could be more committed to that thing that I said I'd be a part of, but too busy. Uh, And it's not your fault, right? Because everybody's busy. And we understand. If someone says we're busy, we think, well, yeah, I, I get you. That's a valid excuse because I can relate because I too am very busy. Jesus had a lot to say about our relationship with time, even though he didn't necessarily say, hey, you guys, you've got to think about how you use your time. He spoke about time a lot. He said things like, uh, don't be anxious, stop worrying. You're fretting about clothes and food and, and things that are good and meaningful. Uh, he goes, well, what about spending time on righteousness? Let's think about priorities. Let, let me take you to uh, Matthew 6, where Jesus says some of these things. He says, uh, don't worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek after these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. It's in Matthew 6. So seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be provided. You may have heard this preached before, something along the lines of, well, so <clears throat> uh, what you need to do is carve out time to serve your church community and kind of you know, bring it in and uh, almost kind of a guilt trip of how come you're not serving in the church. It's not what Jesus is actually saying here. Uh, and I'm sorry if people have used this verse and verses like it to try to manipulate you to do more stuff in or for the church before. He's talking about pursuing himself, actually. He's saying, man, you're running after things out of necessity or out of desire, like want, and these are not bad things to work for. We need to work for them. Uh, saying, but when we seek happiness in those things, uh, we won't find, or we think, seek satisfaction or fulfillment in those things. We build our, the meaning of our life in those things. We may get it for a fleeting moment, but every time we have it, we'll be fearful of losing it because we're the ones who have gone out and got it. And it doesn't last anyway. Like old mate um, Tim Keller, he says, if you aim for happiness, aim for the material, uh, you may get it for a while, but again, you'll be anxious about losing it. it. Never really leads to lasting happiness and you'll likely crowd out holiness in your attempts at getting happiness or satisfaction through those things. But if you pursue Jesus, you get holiness and happiness thrown in too. You get holiness and satisfaction, contentness thrown in too. So if we're not victims of busyness, then it's, it's up to us to determine our busyness. Why do we make ourselves busy? Uh, there, are, there are generally considered to be about seven reasons. Uh, I read a bunch of different studies, uh, very big um, universities and uh, researchers and whatnot, are like a Harvard, John, Johns Hopkins and things like this. Um, three I want, four I want to focus on today. Uh, we use busy as an avoidance mechanism. So if I'm busy, if my life is full, I never have to stop and think. I never have to consider life. I never have to consider the dreams that I haven't achieved. And if, if life, like those thoughts, do start to come into my mind, I can just crowd it out with a, the perennial infinite scroll through social media. Uh, reel after reel, dumbing the pain of my existential angst. Or I don't have to go have that awkward conversation because I'm too busy. I don't have to step into that person's mess. I'm too busy. I don't have to stop and help that person on the street. I'm on I'm, my I'm way. I've got somewhere to go. Uh, flat tire, old mate. Can't. Can't stop. Too busy. Great excuse. Um, or it's okay to have heaps of unfinished business in my life because I'm busy. Oh, sure, I've got a, a dozen unfinished projects. Sure, I said I'd... I said I would say I would do a bunch of different things, but I'm, I'm busy, and so I feel better about not doing those things that I said I'd do or not finishing all the business in my life because look how busy I am, of course. It's understandable, right? Or, of course, I'm not succeeding at this thing, uh, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm okay with it. Um, I'm doing okay, medium rare, like simmer at work. 
that's okay because look at my, how busy my life is and so I feel better about this. I just avoid dealing with life because I'm busy. Or we engage busyness as prestige or pride or a badge of honour. It used to be a generation ago that your leisure was your badge of honour. Look how big my boat is. Look how big my caravan is. Look how amazing my holiday was. My leisure is my badge of honour. These days it's busyness. Look how in demand I am. Look how many pressures on my life are. I must be awesome, right? Because look how busy I am. Or my life must have meaning because look how busy I am. I'm needed in all these different directions. And if, I, if, if I'm not there, if I don't do it, it's going to fall in a heap and therefore I need to be busy. I'm important. Or busy as fear. I can't say no. If I say no, I might get fired. If I say no, what will they think of me? I won't be well thought of. If I say no, I might miss out. I don't want to miss out. I've got to, I've got to go. I've got to say yes. Uh, I, just, I just can't say no to people. I fear saying no to people. Or, again, it's all on me. It's got to be perfect. If I don't make it happen, it's not going to happen. And I fear if I don't go and do it, it won't get done. Or I fear if I don't go and do it and it happens anyway, then maybe I don't really matter so much. So we make ourselves busy, but busyness is killing our fruitfulness. Much of the, uh, the average Christian's busyness isn't about walking in the good works God has prepared in advance for us. How do I know? How can I say a blanket statement like this? I said much, so you know, I've covered my bases there. Uh, but also because in every discipleship group I've ever been in, this constantly comes up. Uh, in every pastor's meeting, probably, that I've ever been in, everyone I can think of, uh, this comes up. In every, um, if you know, well, no, I do some um, like, um, consulting for startups on the side. Every single person, basically, I ever talk to, once we scratch beneath the surface, this is exactly what comes up. I, w- I want to go do that thing, but my life is crowded. Fruitfulness is crowded out. And there might be some, there might be some seasons in your life where... Uh, Not intentionally, not strategically, you're not crowded out and so you can get to fruitfulness. Uh, But often the things that would bring us actually most satisfaction, most meaning in life, and and by satisfaction I mean actually us living into the thing that we were made to be and made to do. Uh, Those things are crowded out by the busyness. Have you noticed that more busyness rarely means more holiness? And so if most Christians, I would suggest, would state as a life goal, yeah, I want to become more like Jesus. I want to be, I want to be holy. I want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I want to be righteous like Jesus. And I'll, and I'll do it one day when I'm not so busy. My question is, how's that working out for you? Because if we take a snapshot of the last five or even ten years of our lives, we look back and if we said that five years ago or ten years ago, looking forward and go, well, when I'm not so busy, in five, like when I finish study, <clears throat> then I won't be so busy uh, and then I'll be able to pursue the things of God. Oh, well, I, I finish study, well, I'm brand new at work, new job, got to really concentrate here. When I'm not so busy, uh, then, I'll, then I'll go do it. Oh, I could prom- I'm actually quite good at this job and, and, and uh, it's becoming more and more of my life or I've met a spouse or start to have kids or, uh, you know, when, when the kids are in school, then I will have more time and I'll be able to, our oh, kids are in school, my last cry, when, when, this kids, when the kids leave home, then I'm going to have more time, uh, then I'm going to go pursue the things, uh, kids leave school, uh, well, now I'm, I'm running the show at work uh, or I said yes to a, bu- you know, a bunch of different commitments, I'm actually very uh, skilled at my job and I'm in high demand, when, maybe when I retire, when I retire, then I'll have time uh, to go and do you understand what I'm saying? It's funny how this works. It's almost as if there is a battle going on for our attention and our time. And there is a battle. And we're losing the battle because we're not in the fight, actually. That's why we lose the battle. 
We don't know there's a battle. We, just think we, we, are, we are a conquered people. We're victims of our busyness. We're, like, we're, we're conquered. I understand that. I understand I am subject to my busyness. But we don't, we don't understand actually that we could participate in the battle. We can start on destroying busyness when we realise that we're not a victim of our busyness. And when I say we, there may be genuinely some people uh, who are victims of their busyness. Like I'm, I'm, and even then, let me give an example. So I have a mate who is a surgeon who's telling me he works 12 out of 14 days. Uh, those are days are very, very long days, like double-digit hour minimum days. <clears throat> and so he has two days off in every 14 days. Uh, and so he says, I am too busy. To do. In fact, he's one of the guys who said, well, later in life, I, I will, I will suss, out, I'll suss out Jesus. Um, too busy. But even then, uh, vocationally has decided, chosen the vocation that has edged out holiness. So this is how serious we need to take it, where we even think down to the level of, well, what about my my vocation, my job, if my job is edging out my holiness, my, my Christ-likeness, then I, I put it to you that in consultation, not from a guilt trip from a pastor from the front, but in consultation with your friends and discipleship group and mentors and whatnot, consider if that is the vocation for you. When do I get busy? Like me personally, I get busy when I get undisciplined or wrongly prioritised. They're, they're two big ones for me. If I'm undisciplined, I get busy. Sounds like it'd be the opposite, right? When you're disciplined, you can like pack your plate, but it's the opposite. And when I have wrong priorities. So if I could just pull these apart for you as an example, and hopefully in the discipleship groups, you will look at your own life and pull apart some of these things. Uh, when I'm undisciplined, I put things off but the things don't go away. The time goes away, but I fill the time with other things. The things that actually won't help me achieve the goals that I actually want to do. So even if I write down all my goals and I know this is the kind of person I want to be, in fact, even like on the, on the front page of my phone, I have five goals, like five things I want to do in my life. There's holy, happy, healthy, humble, hungry. Uh, they're kind of five things that I want to remind myself every time I pick up my phone Am I going to mindlessly scroll through the phone uh, or whatever else it is, or am I going to do things that are going to lead to one of those five outcomes in my life? Tasks build up when I put them off. The tasks build up. Uh, or things like um, exercise or eating healthy or checking in on friends or things like that don't happen. But those things don't stack up. So those things go into deficit. When I, am, I'm, and when I am undisciplined with like, not exercising, uh, I get less healthy. When I uh, don't engage friends and build relationships, the relationships don't get better. Uh, the stuff for entropy and get worse. When I don't do work, on the other hand, it does stack up. And so we get way out of balance when we're undisciplined. I read an article recently talking about ghost quitting work. So ghost quitting, apparently it's a new fad. And in fact, the author was saying, you should ghost quit your work, which is where you, you don't actually resign, you just mentally check out. And you do the minimum possible viable effort and output in order to not get fired. This is called ghost quitting, apparently. Uh, online you know, remote work has made this even easier to do because you don't have to physically even rock up at a workplace for many workplaces. Uh, <clears throat> you can just check in uh, you know, in the morning or random Zoom meetings or those kinds of things. Or if you do have to physically rock up, you physically rock up and do the, again, the minimum possible. The virtue for the ghost quitter, the, the virtue for the ghost quitter is minimum effort to not get caught. It's not efficiency, mind you. It's not minimum effort for maximum results. It's not, well, if I do 80%, uh, if, if I do 50% effort, I can still produce 90% of the results. Therefore, let's, let's go for that. It's, it's not that at all. It's what is the least possible effort I can actually exert and time I can give to just not get fired. That's the, base, the baseline. Efficiency can be anti-busy. 
um, as you're only doing the work which produces the desired result, but it's not necessarily anti-busy because you might just fill up the other 50% with more busyness. Uh, but more and more, as I'm reading this article, I'm realizing more and more people in Australia are approaching all of life like ghost quitters, not just their work. It's minimum possible effort to not be fired. We tackle or we, we engage in relationships like this, not every relationship, but some relationships like this. Minimum effort to not get fired from the relationship. Uh, ghost quit, even um, like sp in spouses, something that uh, has, has probably happened for a long time, but man, a, a lot of my week, uh, week to week, is being spent with, I mean, thankfully people not at City Light Church, um, where in all of the cases, at least at the moment, the husbands have just checked out of the relationship. They don't want to quit, they want the relationship. I don't want to do any of the work. Parenting, uh, we tackle parenting on this, ghost quitting church. How can I ghost quit church? Just to the minimum, I'll rock up, uh, you know, minimum possible to kind of not get noticed or we approach God like this, ghost quit our faith. Um, it is the spirit of the age is to ghost quit. And the reason that people ghost quit is because, well, my life is so full with all these other endeavors and things that I want to do. This is from the article. Uh, I want to go and pursue those things. I want to go learn those things. I want to go do that. I want to fill my life with everything except for work. As if work can't be meaningful. But again, we do this. What we do is we try to spin all of the plates. We try to do all of the things and we do none of the things well. But it's okay because we're busy, right? And we understand that's a good excuse. Too often it's because we're undisciplined leading to disordered living, leading to busyness squeezing out the goodness of life. Uh, or, like I mentioned before, for me, it's because we become wrongly prioritized. So uh, in a wrongly prioritized, like disordered life, you have a list of priorities. Uh, in an ordered life, those priorities are in the right order. In a disordered life, those items are in an unhelpful order. And so if we have hours for streaming or gaming or socializing, uh, whether on social media or in person, and now these things are good things. I'm not putting down those things at all. I'm saying when they are wrongly ordered, uh, recreation, hobbies, interests, learning, again, all great things, gifts from God. I believe every single one of them, a gift from God for us when we engage it in the right order, like in a, in a rightly prioritized order. And again, I'm not having a go, no judgment. I'm just trying to help us understand there are a lot of things vying for your attention and for your time. And many of them, again, have been carefully constructed, um, <clears throat> tested, uh, you know, split testing, A-B testing, nuanced, uh, to try to discover what is the absolute best possible way, not just to get a group of people's attention, but your like, specific you as an individual to get your attention which is why the ads that pop up are the ads that you talk to a friend about and you're like, wait, my device is listening to me because this ad, I never typed it into anything ever. But you don't have to because they know, they know you better than you know yourself. They want your attention. They are in a fight for your attention because that's how they survive. Ever heard the, the saying, um, if the product is free, you're the product? Uh, it can be said also of these cheap things. Uh, I've said this before. Uh, the founder of Netflix was once in their like, heyday, back when they were beating Disney, or Disney wasn't even a thing at the time. So he was asked, What's, who's your greatest competitor? And he said, sleep is our greatest competitor. <laughs> and it's, tr it's true. Like these things that would rightly, in an ordered life, uh, would say, well, sleep is a priority for us. Um, we need sleep to live, and yet the little thing comes up, you know, watch next episode, click. Are you still watching? Yes. We're not just watching, you're also on your device while you're watching. Because it's a battle for your attention, and you are losing the battle, because you're not even fighting. 
Again, no judgment, just, just perspective. Some of the things uh, that, that I hear more and more, well, I, can't, I can't go and do that important thing. That would be good for me in a rightly ordered you know, priority, a rightly ordered life I would be engaging in. Can't go and do that thing because I have to, I can't go to like discipleship group or family dinner or whatever because I have to study. Oh, we can't argue with that. Study is really important. It's, that would be in an ordered life. Uh, what did you do last night? Oh, I went out. Uh, I just scrolled for four hours. Uh, but when it's, when it's convenient for us, because we're busy, because people understand busy, we can just slot any priority in anywhere we want. Or the classic one that uh, Beck and I kind of joke about all the time is, someone says, well, I can't do that thing. I'm uh, meeting up with these people. It's the only time they had free. To which we say, well, you weren't free, though, because you committed to this other thing already. And in fact, they, they weren't free, and you weren't free, they just have different priorities and you've submitted your priorities to their priorities. You've, sub- you've submitted your busyness to their busyness. Are you undisciplined? Are your priorities out of order? Are you busy because you're avoiding? Are you busy because you're fearful? Are you busy out of pride? It's killing your fruitfulness. Could be killing you, actually. We've got to do it. It's not all doom and gloom. Please, again, I, this... This is not about judgment. This is about how do we collectively get perspective on the battle that's going on that we didn't even know about? How do we then take up arms and fight that battle to kill busyness and win back our lives? In Luke 9, um, a guy comes to Jesus. In fact, Jesus says to a guy, follow me. Come follow me. Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to them, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Uh, I don't think he's having a go at family. Uh, I don't think he's having a go at burying people. Uh, He is talking about exactly what we spoke about at the beginning, where we say, well, of course, Jesus, I want to pursue, let's seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness and then receive all of the benefits of union with you. But first, let me go make my own priority list. And Jesus, you'll be an option in a list of option. And when it's convenient, yes, I can bring you up to the top. Or, or subject to a better offer, Starbo. Um, if, if there's nothing better that comes up, yeah, sure, I'll come gather with your people. Yes, I will pray. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll crack open your scriptures yeah, I'll listen to a sermon or yeah, I'll, I'll worship you with um, my voice or with my time or I'll go encourage to, or neighbour someone. I'll go tell them about you, yeah. But if something else comes up, you understand, Lord, I'm busy. We've crowded out the voice of God with our choice to be busy. We've crowded out the work of God with our choice to be busy. We've embraced a disordered life and have pretty much stopped complaining about the effects of busyness, uh, the lack of holiness, because it's such a slow road and we don't want to get on that road to holiness because it will cost us our busy. If we do want to overcome busy, we need to get in the battle for our attention and fight back. This is what we're going to be doing with our discipleship groups this week. And hopefully just by yourself this week, with your families or your spouse or trusted friend this week to be considering your busyness. What do you want your life to look like? What kind of woman do you want to be? What kind of man do you want to be? What kind of son or daughter do you want to be? What kind of mother or father do you want to be? What kind of worker do you want to be? What kind of neighbour do you want to be? You've got to start with what, is it, what does it look like what is the thing that God is calling us into? What are those good works he's prepared in advance for us to walk in? Who is Jesus? And if God is conforming us to the likeness of Jesus and he is our goal, and what does he look like? And what do we need to jettison from our lives in order to get there? Over the coming weeks, we're going to look at the effect of business on rest, relationships, discipleship, and call. And we're going to look at how do we overcome busy? Because at the end of the day, your busyness, your attention, your time is a worship issue. It's not a productivity issue. It's not an efficiency issue. Um, 
at the end of at the end of the day, it's a worship issue. Worship. This word worship comes from uh, old school, like oldie English and Latin words uh, that mean essentially worth, worthiness. Worship is ascribing worthiness, worthiness to something. And when we give something our time, or give something our attention, we are giving it, we are denoting its worthiness to us. And if we give our worthiness to everything and Jesus is an afterthought in our worthiness, uh, we have a disordered life as people who are united with Christ. I'll say, show me your attention. Like, what do you give your attention to? I'll show you what you worship. This doesn't mean, well, I've got to quit my job and go work for a Christian organisation. Some of the people who are the worst at this are people who work in churches and for Christian organisations. It's not about... Yeah, having a Christ, Christian, quote, um, vocation. Uh, it's about how are we spending our time and what are we ascribing, what are we giving worth to? Okay, that was a heavy... I told you to be short, so we'll get to the solutions in the week to come. But the solutions start with knowing you're in a battle. It's a battle for your worship, battle for your time, battle for your attention. It's a battle for your soul, ultimately. We haven't been in the battle. We need to get in the battle. Uh, Your adversaries are things that aren't even necessarily bad. Like, again, uh, hobbies and learning and recreation and good rest, uh, vocation work, family, um, sport, you know, all these kinds of things. Even, let me say, even like computer games, Uh, social media can be a good, a gift from God. But if we are ascribing all of our worthiness to those things at the expense of to God, we need to do some work. The battling for your time and your attention. I'm not saying don't give them any. I'm saying let's order our lives, let's get our priorities right and let's step into the life that God is calling us into. So again, no judgment, no shame today, no shame this week as we gather. I I am confident almost all of us are in the same boat and so together we are going to join the battle together for our time and our attention to kill busyness. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you. You haven't left us to our own devices to try to figure things out for ourselves, to try to do the battle by ourselves. I thank you that not only are you in the battle with us, but you've won the battle already. And so for, for us and all of us who aren't really walking in the victory that you've won for us, help us, Lord. We, we do, we want to be holy. We want to walk in the righteousness that you have purchased for us with the precious blood of your son, Jesus. And so we're sorry for how we've crowded out your voice, your spirit, and your work. Help us, Father, not to, not to feel shame this morning, but to rightly uh, view our lives, to have perspective on um, the order of our priorities, to see areas of fear or pride, undiscipline, and help us together in partnership with your spirit, Father, um, to put to death those things, to cast off everything that holds us back, and to step into the way of life they have for us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.